We're, we're very honored to have Dr. Jason Whaley joining, from, uh, joining us today. He's the reader in telecommunications management at the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. Uh, and so he, if you have his uh, bio in your packages, but you'll know he has degrees from Cambridge, uh, Leeds, and uh, Strathclyde as well. And his particular research interest is in the structure of telecommunication market. This is a joint, a joint note with my uh, co authors, Ewan Sutherland, who is sat in Glasgow. Very importantly, uh, He's actually Scottish, I'm English, okay? So, I can say things about Scotland several thousand miles away, but I'm a bit hesitant about doing that when I'm actually at home. Um, so what we're going to talk about is sort of about sort of the UK initially, and we'll put sort of what's happened in Scotland within the context of the United Kingdom. As some of you may know, there's some interesting uh, political developments happening uh, in the UK, both at a sort of a UK level as well as in Scotland. We'll talk about sort of broadband, which links into some of the earlier comments from this morning, and then we'll move on to talking about what's actually been happening, and in particular, um, the initiatives that the government has taken to try to encourage the availability of uh, broadband within rural areas. Um, there's nothing about adoption there, because one of the great lessons about this is that they seem to have forgotten that people have to use it to get the benefits. Um, and that's one of our key points to put back towards the end. So, my passport says, uh, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and a favorite pastime uh, to, with foreign students is to say, okay, what's the name of the country you're studying in? Uh, and they say, England. No, England's a bit of the south, and the thing you're having to do when you're in Scotland is to tell people you're actually studying in England. We have a single entity, United Kingdom. That's what has the seat at the United Nations. That is the entity that goes to the European Union. But we have a nice little trick, particularly quite useful when playing sports, okay? We're actually four member nations within the United Kingdom. So we have England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And it, just before the previous break, I checked the FIFA world rankings. And so England is ranked number six. Uh, Scotland, well, sorry, Wales is number 60, Scotland is 70, and sort of Northern Ireland is the 100th best team in the world out of 160 of different teams. And football, rugby, cricket, we have four nations. Uh, we go to the Olympics as one team, however, Team GB, which basically means that we ignore uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, politically sensitive, and the Northern Irish join with the Southern Irish and rugby in an Ireland or Ireland team. And we have a nice, confused situation. And that's actually very important to remember as we talk about broadband, talk about sort of telecommunications going forward. This is not a simple one nation anymore. We're not a federal country, nor are we just basically one entity. We're somewhere stuck in between, which is creating lots of interesting questions. The football sort of rankings also sort of mirror quite nicely in some ways onto the economic rankings. Uh, the UK, basically, the engine of economic growth is England. I saw on Monday a former editor of a right-wing newspaper, a tabloid, has basically advocated a new political party, and they, that party will be for the southeast of England. So London and the home counties, and they should leave the UK because they create the money and everyone else spends it. It's a simple argument. And, look, to some degree, he's correct. You know, the economic growth is the southeast of England. So the previous speaker, sort of uh, from the North Lancashire, one of the issues that you get as you go further up England is that central economic activity have struggled in many for probably the last 30, 40 years about reinventing themselves. And so you get financial services and retailing in the south and the R and D. As you go further up north, there's issues about lots of manufacturing. Scotland accounts for roughly eight percent of uh, the UK economic activity. We have 5 million people. 5.224, we're actually increasing for the first time in many years as a country. So if you went by sort of the last 15 or so years, there's a nice decrease each year when information comes out. Less people, where are they going? They're going to the south of England, or they're doing the traditional Scottish thing, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, okay? And you still see people doing that migration even though the economy is doing better. We have four countries, and we have three distinct sort of capitals, Edinburgh, Cardiff, and Wales, and then 
England has no capital apart from London, which is also the capital of the United Kingdom. So you have very interesting situations whereby MPs who are from Scotland can contribute on English matters, but not vice versa, because we're not a federal system. When it comes to sort of looking at Scotland, well, this is sort of a, a map of, of Scotland. The dots represent uh, the cities, okay? And um, if you take the simple parts of the country between Glasgow on the west coast and Edinburgh on the east, and all the small places in between, there's roughly 1.3 million people in this area. And this is sort of the, the, the high density uh, area in terms of economic activity, population densities, the ones that it's relatively easy to serve in terms of telecommunications. The other cities vary in size. We have 30,000 people um, in, sort of, in sort of Stirling, which as a university was quite small. Perth is also small. Dundee, um, Aberdeen are bigger. Particularly important for Aberdeen is the economic activity surrounding oil and gas. So oil and gas uh, first came online just after Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister in 1979, and that was basically funded and fueled the economic growth there. So whilst this is quite far away from the main part of the economic activity, it is quite prosperous. Um, the shading area we've got, we have two sort of regional development agencies. And the grey bit is where you can work longer in your craft. You don't have to start working when the lights, when the dark it goes dark. Do more the longer. People can stay there. And Gordon Brown, our uh, last prime minister before the current one, uh, did actually say that the parallels between broadband and electricity are actually quite apt. One of the few things he actually said which made sense in his last sort of couple of months before the election was that he said, if you go back and look what happened in terms of economic growth, there was a fill up, there was a sort of flip up. People didn't fall out as fast as previously, so we have some sort of precedence. And he, his argument was broadband will do exactly the same thing. It will keep people in the rural areas. And that in itself is very good for the other services in these areas. One of the things that um, if you're with child, and that's quite popular to discuss at the minute given the pregnancy announced yesterday, uh, for instance, in this part of the country here, there is no local hospital which can deal with you. So very much like uh, the First Nations talk yesterday, what do you have to do? A couple of weeks beforehand, you go off to the mainland, even today, okay? And so yeah, you either go off planned, which means get into an ambulance, get onto a ferry, get onto another ambulance and spend about three and a half hours going to the closest hospital, or they call out a, a helicopter, I think at 14,000 pounds per hour, to, to ferry you back to the mainland quickly. And people then leave this part, and they go to Glasgow, they go to Edinburgh, and they stay. And that's relatively close. I have colleagues who commute, it takes two hours. And it's basically, it's trains, planes, and almost sort of automobiles type of thing. Every transport possible together. And people are moving from this part of the country into Glasgow. Up here, as Inverness is growing, people move from the countryside into Inverness. So you're getting, within the relatively low population density areas of the Highlands, people moving to here, people moving to here. This part of the country is somewhat desolate in terms of landscape, and it's a very precarious lifestyle. So um, there's been people who have moved back, and we'll come and talk about those later on, about how, why they've moved back, but also the benefits they get from technology. The, here is England, and if you sort of go down from Glasgow, this is a, a, a population area of relatively low population density, small villages, towns which were based on traditional manufacturing or uh, extractive industries which have sort of struggled to cope. So we have, in the last 20 years, seen the decline of mines. There's one mine left in Scotland, there's one mine left, I think mine left in the UK. Uh, lots of the manufacturing has gone, and this is a struggle. What is replacing that, quite interestingly, is renewables in terms of construction, but not actually the design. If you look at how the UK is set up, well, Scotland has always been different. So the Act of Union in 1707, what is interesting about that is that you can have the education system being different and the legal system being different as well. So since 1707, we've had a separate um, educational structure, which means that if you go to university in Scotland, your undergraduate degree is four years. If you do it south of the border, um, it's three. More importantly, quite recently, if you go to university in Scotland, you don't pay your fees 
if you're an undergraduate, and if you go down south, you pay £9,000 a year. And if you're English, running up to Scotland, they charge you £9,000 a year. Okay, you can't get away from the fees. Um, we have a devolved administration. It's not a federal system. Um, there's been lots of discussions since the 1930s about independence with the SNP sort of point, the point being set up. And what is interesting is that discussions from the 1970s culminated uh, in the late 1990s with the Scotland Act, which gave a devolved administration to Scotland. So you can spend the money we give you. So the UK money collects the tax, they hand it over to Scotland, and Scotland then spends the money. So it has some freedom. It also has freedom to raise tax powers, okay? So two pence in the pound can be, spent, can be raised and spent within Scotland. And that can be then used to fulfill the priorities of the government. And we have a different elect electoral system. It's PR, not first past the post. So we have coalitions. And you get compromise, okay? And that's actually quite an interesting development. The Westminster system where it's confrontational versus the Scottish system where it is more consensual. But the Scottish system is also informed by being slightly more left-wing than England is. So actually spending money from the state is not seen to be a bad thing. Actually, the state can do good occasionally, which is slightly different from the south of England approach, which is basically the state is bad, let's get rid of it. We have a first minister, Alex Salmond, who uniquely, the system is set up to have a, a coalition. He actually won a majority, which is a surprise in a system designed not to do that. So he's now begun a discussion about having uh, an independent Scotland. We will have a vote just after the anniversary of Bannockburn in 2014, which is an anniversary, of course, of Scotland beating England. Um, and it's like battle, not football, or cricket, or rugby, or any sport. Um, and the idea would be by 2016, Scotland will be independent. Uh, Ewan, who's basically in Saturday Glasgow at the minute, gave a paper on Friday in the department about possibility of independence in telecoms, well, everything that has to be done. And no planning has been done. No planning about anything has been done apart from um, the, your license for your car will be done by England, we'll still have the pound, and we'll be a social union rather than a union or something, and we'll still have the queen, etc., etc. But the practicalities of independence have not been discussed, and you know, before now, between now and 2016. Even though Scotland is devolved, the Scotland Act said some things are actually important across the entire UK, and telecoms is one of those. Defence, banking, etc. Okay? So telecoms is done at the UK level. And just to make life a bit more complicated, Ofcom is set up that every nation has an advisory committee, and they have the great and the good commenting on policies from their perspective, the Scottish perspective, or the Welsh perspective, which then feeds into um, Ofcom policy making. There's 116 people in Ofcom, four of which are based in Scotland. So the question is how much influence do they actually have on policy making? I just noticed that there's no timing going, so I have no idea how long it's going. Um, so he, uh, that is then mirrored, of course, in Wales and Northern Ireland and England. Okay? There's also other committees which are about uh, people with disabilities and access to ICT. There's broadcasting, there's content and so forth and so forth. All these fit together to influence the discussions. What has been very important in the broadband discussion in Scotland is a need to sustain rural communities. People are leaving, and if they leave, it becomes very expensive to have hospitals and very expensive to provide education. There is one university outside the city, the University of the Highlands and Islands, that was created quite recently it is not a fully fledged university as we would understand it. Um, it has very limited, limited research powers, but it's a way of getting people to stay in communities. And that's underpinned by technology. E government's important in austerity Britain. E government is basically should really be let's do things online because it's cheaper. So as you move towards having people using uh, e government, Availability becomes important, and once availability is dealt with, adoption and use becomes important. And on that basis also, do you have the necessary skills? If you look at so Scotland as a picture, what's well, a very interesting thing, this, the right-hand column is about rural Scotland, 
Rural Scotland has exactly the same take-up as uh, the UK as a whole, which is quite surprising. And indeed, urban Scotland has less. Uh, that is solely down to one city, Glasgow, where only half the people in the town actually use broadband. And the other cities are all at 70, 80 percent. And one reason, you know, and that's down due to poverty, it's down to skills, it's down to, I'm burying my head in the sand, I want to use it. So far. And you go down the list, you know, Scotland does relatively well, particularly sort of rural areas do very well. Uh, one thing I found very surprising was the amount of e-reader take-up in rural areas being better than the UK as a whole. Um, tablets are less, bundles are important, um, equal to the UK average. Fixed line is important, you know, we'll come on to talk about this in a second, but fixed line really means basically PT, the incumbent. Uh, we don't really have choice. Um, this is looking at the different types of broadband, again, it's fixed becomes the important. We, are, we have, in the UK, talked a lot about fixed broadband, a lot about how to get that out to communities, whether it's in urban areas or rural areas. And the, the emphasis for, since about 2003, has been about doing fixed. And what's been interesting is when you've raised issues around sort of mobile and 4G, these are recent discussions. Uh, Ofcom seems to be surprised at the number of people having uh, just mobile broadband connections. And indeed, when you ask people why they do this, it's things like credit. It is cheaper to get a mobile uh, broadband um, account because you don't have to pay the incumbent £150 to prove you're credit worthy. And instead, you can go off and get a page to go contract, and the barriers to participation are actually less. There's also been sort of a, an increase. We've questioned quite a lot about the sort of stagnation of the growth of, of broadband, particularly in Scotland. Last year it's gone up, that could be a blip. The, the sample size for this is actually very small. Okay, there's two and a half thousand people sometimes are in the samples, this is for the entire UK. And then when you go down to Scotland, it's like 400 to 500 people. So um, the academic in me says, can we have more data please? And the regulator says, it's okay, it's fine. Trust us, we're the regulator. And we'll be done. What's actually happened in terms of initiatives in, in rural areas? Go back to 2001, an aspiration to provide affordable and pervasive broadband. Two terms which are not defined, but the presentation and the discussion around it are very clear about, well, getting some form of broadband commitment. Broadband at this time, by the way, is anything that's narrow, not narrowband. So 14.4 and above counted which was a bit of a surprise when you actually asked them what can you do with 14.4. Um, and over time, what has happened, the first sort of three elements are about ADSL. In rural areas, BT, the incumbent, decided they are not going to upgrade their exchanges. A very clear policy. They're happily stated that it's not economically viable, there's no demand, um, but of course, if you want to pay us some money, we'll do it. And so what you saw, in 2005 is in essence the government paying BT to upgrade just under 300 exchanges. At this point, all the strategies in place about use stopped. The Scottish government thought that if you have it, people will use it. Why do you have to tell them about the value of broadband? There used to be very good community-based projects going around the country saying, here's your internet, here's your internet banking, here's your online retailing going around to farms and small communities that all stopped. All advertising on television stopped. It's almost the same day as the sign with BT, bang, gone. And at the moment, there's been nothing to replicate that at all in Scotland. There has in the England, under a UK policy, but that doesn't seem to get north of the border. So availability is the emphasis. More recently, 2010, 2012, we have uh, talk about next generation and world class. World class is a nice phrase that is used quite a lot in education, it's used quite a lot in uh, government policies. It is not defined. One point is basically to be better than the UK average, and the UK is average compared to Europe. So really, we want to just be sort of the sort of U European average in terms of speed. Talks about one gigabyte, talks about 100 megabit, 150, no. We're talking 20 to 50 at the most. And indeed, the policy talks, the most recent discussion in the policy, dropped the speed. So we're actually going backwards, not forward in terms of speed. 
There is no talk about what you can actually do with your fast speeds. It's all about you're going to have a fast speed, something will happen in the future, uh, but we don't know what about. Two other new policy discussions, both of which are interesting but also very flawed at the same time. The Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is the academic society of the country, came up with policy, and they, they emphasised backhaul. They said one issue which has stopped broadband in rural areas is a lack of backhaul infrastructure, which is actually cost effective. And they pointed the finger at certain incumbents and certain providers of, of national uh, fiber networks. They had all series of comparisons with other countries, all of which were basically uh, superficial, shallow, and don't really tell you very much, and suggest they've been done on Wikipedia. Uh, really <laughs> quite bad. Report of Scotland, um, they said to have a champion, have someone in government who says broadband is good. And not because of the Reform of Scotland, um, document, but that's actually now emerged. There's a cabinet secretary with responsibility. And there's a committee which discusses infrastructure. And that's actually quite an achievement. You can go to this committee. Admittedly, when you and myself went to it last year, we got questions like, isn't the internet bad? Bad for what, sir? Bad for everything. You can do lots of nasty things on it. Very little engagement, though, <laughs> with, uh, with commentators. Universal service, we don't have an explicit fund. We have effectively an obligation based on BT who does it almost at the good of the goodness of their heart. We paid them close to 40 million pounds to do the last uh, exchanges. There's never been any assessment that that's actually good value for money. And BT is the effectively the only provider in, in many parts of the country. And we'll see in a second, it's played a very good game. Huge number of not spots. It's actually quite embarrassing. After all this money's been spent, there are so many not spots, including where I live in the centre of Glasgow. Uh, this is a nice map produced by the BD UK. BD UK is the now thankfully approved by the European Union program from the UK government. We have 530 million pounds to spend. This is money from the digital switchover, which was left. This money's gone to provide infrastructure in rural communities, and. <coughs> Basically, the notion is everyone pays. The government pays and the communities pay, or the local council pay. So if you want to bid for 10 million pounds, you need 10 million pounds for matching funding. As the previous talker from North Lancashire sort of pointed out, you know, she's up here, uh, PT's not going to be interested. There was an alternative company, Fujitsu, who wanted to do a UK-wide rural broadband with lots of fiber. They costed it out, it said it would be two billion. Can we have some money, please, government? And the government said no. This is the pot of money from the government, only 530 million across the entire UK. Uh, transferred money, uh, Scotland had to beg, borrow, steal money off the UK to get it sure. 8% um, of the UK means that they should get at least 8% of the money, and they're doing relatively well. Money initially went into England, into Scotland. Again, it's funding these targets. Two megabits is the, is the default sort of setting for the UK. Two megabits allows you to do important things like uh, download iPlayer, which is the BBC sort of distribution channel, and to do all your content online. It's sufficient to do most things in the UK for it to off -call. Scotland has done well, but the interesting question is then where is the money, the additional money coming from? Because somebody has to pay for this. And the policy documents which have been provided are slightly opaque in sources of funding. And there is indeed a shortage. If you top up all the amounts of money put together, we estimate 60, 70 million pounds is sort of missing from the budgets, and somebody has to pay for that, and nobody will actually say we're going to pay for it. Quite a lot of discussion at the conference so far about open access. Open access in Scotland would require <laughs> political compromise. It would require councils to actually talk to one another and be nice to one another across council districts. And for mu much of the discussion, this has not been possible because they see it in a very territorial way. It's, it's jobs for the boys in terms of people on the board, etc. What is interesting is that both the Highlands and Islands Project and the South of Scotland Lines have got open access built into this. Open access in the South of Scotland is a simple acknowledgement no council can do this on their own. They have no money, and what they have done is that they have aggregated their demand. So hospitals, council employees, council offices, 
the, the guy from Tennessee says key anchor, community anchor points. All that sort of thing feed in. That's about 25% of the capacity, and that's sufficient to get the funding in place to fund these projects. And that is actually new. And it's a big change. And indeed, there's been lots of pressure from central government in Scotland to do this. Um, and that's now translated. And central government is controlled by one party, and these councils are controlled by other parties. So there's been a, some political tension, as we say, as well. Highlands and Islands. Highlands and Islands had a plan several years ago for broadband. And the first day that BD UK was open, they said, here you are, can we have some money? And they were actually being very, very proactive. They need to get jobs back into the highlands. So they've done this for quite a while. If we're going to sort of go forward, though, we've got this very interesting discussion about 4G. We don't have 4G. Um, we started the discussion before most countries in Europe, and almost certainly will be the last country to finish, uh, because several operators have gone to court and challenged how Ofcom could allocate it. In one of the consultations, uh, the Scottish government says, 4G should be used as a way of, of broadening coverage and creating almost a second infrastructure. We have BT, let's get mobile in as best as we can to cover areas, and the 4G to this. So they said 98%, not of the country, but of every local authority area. So in Glasgow, it's really easy to do 98%, we do 100. But as you move away from Glasgow, population density go down, it gets mountainous, population spread out further, in those areas, it's also 98%. And they said this without costing it. And we've asked them several times, can you please provide a costing? And we were told well, that's commercially sensitive. So in a good old fashioned way, I've got a grad student over the summer who tried to do a costing. We contacted every manufacturer of hardware in Europe, and only Nokia and Siemens would give us anything like decent information. And they said, everything's in a range. So our range, our estimate, it will cost between sort of 70 million and 100 million just to build out the infrastructure and the, to get the 98%. And depending on how you do the time frame and the rollout obligations, this will go up. If you basically have a very tight roll obligation, we reckon the building costs will drive this up, not the, not the infrastructure per se, but the guys digging the holes, putting that the, in the power, etc. That will drive things up. We've also done an analysis of how much revenue you would get from going from sort of 90 to 95 to 98 percent, and this doesn't cover anything why this costs. So that raises interesting <coughs> questions about are you going to subsidize this one operator who gets the additional obligation when they're rolling forward? And there's been no discussion of any form of subsidy whatsoever. It's a company's going to get this, they're going to do it out of their own heart, good to their own heart, and they'll be stuck with it. We just don't believe anyone's going to buy this nice line. We, What's interesting about Scotland is that until very recently, community projects have been off the radar. People haven't really talked about them. In some of the urban areas, that's because the local means of doing that, like housing associations, have had no money. In rural areas, it's been a lack of expertise, and lack of understanding about how you put together the technology. Um, this community project, however, has the added advantage of having a professor of computer science from Edinburgh University as a country home, country house on the lake. And basically, he's basically set up this project very similar to the Broadband for Rural North, um, which we talked about previously, the community trying to do things to themselves. And this is a whole series of wireless connections across uh, from the mainland towards the sky and so forth. This has worked relatively well. Okay? No company wants to go anywhere near this. Uh, BT quite happily had arguments in, in public and private saying we're going to touch this, it's not economically attractive, there's no obligation to do this. He has driven this forward and he's got pots of money and he's small amounts of money from many different sources which together has allowed him to do things. And then he's leveraged his position as an academic, he got free labour from his grad students uh, <laughs> to do some work. But the question, I think an interesting question which is not discussed is, is it a, effectively a fixed approach? It's, we're, we're fixated with fixed. Satellite, which has been discussed here, is never really mentioned. In contrast, if you go to rural England, satellite is actually a very viable alternative. So uh, I have colleagues who live outside Norwich. They have, rural is a rural area, they have satellite. 
It is cheaper and more cost effective than doing any other solution. In Scotland, when you would have thought it would be attractive, it has not been on the table whatsoever. Instead, we're doing creative things with fixed technologies, and we've not, not entered into a discussion which will allow us to go and say, in some communities, it's going to be a wireless, some communities it will be a satellite, and some will be fixed. Um, that seems to be off. Uh, there is a, a new project, a community broadband Scotland project, £5 million. Pounds. They have spent it over three years. We're almost at the end of 2012. They have spent nothing. Uh, indeed, they've just about worked out that they will have to apply to the European Union for state aid uh, permission, which took the best part of a year for the BD UK. And what they want to do is to train people. They're, they're sort of acknowledging that actually you need champions, you need enthusiastic, skilled people in communities to actually get things going. And how can we best do that? We can give them training. So they're going to have a training program in terms of engineering, regulatory, potentially business skills, which allows small communities to put things together for themselves. It'll be interesting to see how this actually works in practice. It's great in theory, it's great on the website, but in reality, there will be challenges. I think state aid will be one challenge. A second issue is going to be getting people to go to these communities. Um, it's being done in the central belt. It's not being done in the rural areas. So the training is going to have to, you have to come to a different part of the country for training. And it's five million pounds. Five million pounds doesn't sound like a lot of money, but actually in the Scottish context, it's actually quite a lot of money uh, in contrast to the 50 odd million pounds we talked about. We've got a potential for satellites. Um, this is UK wide. This is fantastically good speeds. If you get these speeds, you're doing better than most people in the UK, irrespective of your location. Um, you know, I, the two important words in any UK advert a discussion about broadband up to. Um, so I get theoretically up to eight, um, and I get actually two. And if you get to 20, you're probably going to be getting something like 16, 18. So actually, on these connections, you get very good speeds better speeds than most parts of the country with the, the duopoly infrastructure. We have nice challenges. We have different ways of government. We have the UK putting a 530 million pound in. That money gets given to Edinburgh. Edinburgh then gives the money to local communities or local authorities. And getting the coordination between these levels of government is problematic, not least of which, not least of which, because we have conservatives in the UK, we have nationalists who are happy to have an argument to blame the UK at the Scottish level, and we have Labour at the town hall level. We have three political parties interacting. Never a good recipe for getting things done smoothly. But it also is about where does authority actually stop? Who has responsibility? There's no clear cut way of allocating responsibility to an institution saying it's your job to do this. So you get a mishmash of initiatives happening at different levels, which require money from different sources, and lots of people are chasing the same amounts of money without actually doing a coordinated approach. So you're going after the same pot, someone gets there before you, and if you can learn from them or pick it back on them, you're going to miss out. Basically, we have lots of fixed infrastructure um, focus. So doing wireless approaches has not been that popular. Um, you could do the 4G, this will be a, a, an expensive issue to do if you're going to be the operator. Um, what's interesting is that one of the 3G operators, Liverpool 3, has actually just given out 200 3G phones and broadband connections in a village which is literally in the middle of, um, middle of nowhere, in Scotland. It's one of the most remote communities. And there is no commercial rationale for this. And the question is, are they actually thinking about bidding for this, fourth, uh, this 4G license? because this will give them some expert experience of providing a service in a very rural community of less than 200 people, which is several hours away from the next urban area by road, and which has a very precarious sort of economic infrastructure of farming and tourism. That's right in the north um, west of the country. And there's nothing about use, nothing. Everything is about getting an infrastructure in place which actually makes sense for the country. No discussion. 
the UK government pushes uh, what's called Rate Online uh, 2012, which is a UK-wide sort of advertising campaign. That stops at the border. There's nothing. Uh, there's, and when you ask them, they say, well, you've got it, so why don't you use it? And you, we've raised these questions in for parliamentary committees. We've raised them in open discussion with Ofcom. There is no seeming interest to actually go off and do the next step now that everyone has at least some form of uh, broadband. Which is, a, I think, ma raises major issues about e government, e services, and all these sort of activities which are based on this. I'm particular about using, keeping people in communities. In terms of what's happened in rural areas, you know, fantastic success stories about adoption, people want to use it. Uh, it is relatively slow in many areas. Uh, there is no upgrade plans going forward if you've got BT. Uh, BT basically are prioritizing urban areas, particularly in the south. When the super fast allocation of money came out, Edinburgh in Scotland received it. Edinburgh has a really good network anyway, and other communities were sort of slightly overlooked. What happens about going forward, about upgrading? The discussion about BT was, we have lots of PFI and PPP in Scotland. They are, the contracts are incredibly tight. There is no scalability. There is no innovation clause built into these contracts. So if you want to actually change them at some point in the 25 year lifespan, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and basically, there's no money. 530 million pounds for the entire UK pales into insignificance when you look at what our European neighbors are spending. Ireland, as a much smaller country, spent I think best part of 400 million euros on rural areas alone. And we're doing that, and it's a lot smaller geography area. So we have major challenges for that. Nobody thinks that this, this is actually important, uh, but all politicians will quite happily talk about it. Um, those are our contacts. Thanks, Mike, 35 minutes. So do you have any questions? Thanks very much, Jason. We, we do have time for a couple questions. Any Thanks. I'm, I'm going to keep asking these use uh, questions and uptake questions. Um, how much of that relates to the affordability factor in Scotland? Have you had feedback from any of your work around around the cost side? In affordability is incredibly important. Um, if you look in rural communities, the average, you know, the average farmer. The UK wide figure, the average farmer is getting about £8,000, £9,000 a year in terms of income. Incredibly thin margins of their pot. So if you're going off and you're paying £20 or £25 per month, it's a big chunk out. There used to be um, tax schemes which allow you to deduct the cost of your computer and some equipment to get your tax. Uh, those were abolished by one of the uh, Labour administrations. So actually, there's less support for them. Um, there's anecdotal evidence in some of the urban areas that the credit issue, so getting sort of a credit, is, is a big problem for many people, and that they are reluctant to have a broadband connection because you have to pay £150 to the incumbent, to your operator, a sort of a deposit, and then you're recurring to any, any charges. Um, the open reach connection for a broadband um, line, £90. So you looking at sort of three or four hundred pounds quite easily, and that's actually quite a lot of money for most, most households to pay. So affordability is a big issue. We've also found, again, in some rural communities, it's, if one person gets it, there's lots of people piggybacking, going around and knocking on the house, come and have some tea, by the way, come and do that broadband. <laughs> so, yeah, and there's, there's Tesco, the online retailer, uh, there's evidence coming out of studies of Tesco retailers that when they move into an area and they extend their online distribution area into rural areas, then people will club together to get a broadband connection so they can do their shopping. Yes. And they even club together on the sort of the Tesco delivery fee. So it's a very collective activity. So that's been very important trying to go, particularly on the south of the country, where there's very few urban areas with decent, decent sort of shops. I think we have time for one last question. So I was just curious, in, in Canada we have a fairly robust uh, you know, overall ISP industry with quite a few competitors. What's the barrier uh, there for the development of that type of industry? Um, 
money. I think it's because they've been back in those communities. So I think it's, it, money's an issue. Money's an issue in the sense of... Like the local economics, or are you talking... Local economics is one issue, but I think that actually the, getting your ISP set up for the back hole has been a, a major problem. There's, back hole. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. And it's basically, some ISPs who've looked at it have said it's not actually robust enough. So if you want to go in and offer a quality of service, and let's say the connection times, the speeds, the, the back hole is not sufficient to deliver what they would want to deliver. And because there's, you know, Inverness, for instance, has got a relatively vibrant uh, economy. So that attracts lots of ISPs. But the areas around that, which have got low population densities, very few of them are willing to go in to put the equipment in, in the various exchanges, because the costs are very expensive. And the costs are determined by Ofcom regulations, really, to the open reach. So that's put people off. Um, the slow processes in place, Put people off as well. So, 2005 when, when OpenReach was created, it's never achieved in what seven years some of its targets. Um, it's getting close to doing things quickly, but all these things, things combined together to put people off these markets. So you'll see an Inverness competition, you'll see an Aberdeen starting to go through this competition, but in the small communities on the west coast, like Open for instance, there's a it, People won't go there. I'm just surprised at the lack of fixed wireless competition. I mean, you had a, yeah. a research project, but you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. No. It, but there's a fixation with fixed. I mean, fixed piece means it's ADSL. 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 Look, it's ADSL. We're fixed. Yeah. That's a, it's ADSL. What's a fixation? Yeah. It, wireless, wireless fixed has been talked about. There was a very, uh, in the mid 2000s, there was a company with doing wireless fixed. It started off in the um, Central Belt. And the idea was to go on urban populations, they worked out the economics, they could do it, and the banks pulled the plug on it. Um, so the technology wasn't robust enough initially, so they, they, they lost out some customers, got some bad PR, the banks went, sorry, 